Good girl. All right. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the question and answer video that I do most Sundays. If you have gardening questions, you can ask them down below this video. I'm actually in a coat, which I rarely am on this channel. It's like 29 degrees as I'm filming this on Friday morning. And we've needed, we needed a couple more frost and, and light freezes like this just to get everything to sleep because they're still, even here, uh, this is the December 2nd when I'm filming this. There are still things with some gro new growth on them out here. I'd like to get them to sleep before we have a really cold night at some point. So these 33s, 31s, 28s, you know, in that, in that range and where it doesn't stay down below freezing for very long, but long enough to get it there and get these things going to really going to sleep um, for the winter is a good thing. Um, that way we don't have to transition too fast. I'm sure this will apply to a couple questions along the way here, you know, about, um, um, about getting plants to sleep. Uh, so um, over on my uh, website, I mentioned in another video this past week, I put up the uh, December garden checklist video if you haven't watched that. Holly, come here, Holly, come here. Come here, baby. Come here. Come on, come on, come on. Get out of the pansies, please. Get out of the pansies. I already have the rabbits in the pansies. I mentioned uh, in a video earlier this week that I've kind of uh, redone my website some, horttube.com, and I do consultations over there. They're linked down below pretty much every video uh, if you're interested in getting a consultation, but there's also gift cards there if you're interested in giving someone a gardening consultation sometime next year. It's just gives them a code and then they enter the code and then they can pick a time um, on a calendar, you know, that I'm available to meet. And uh, also working on a project over there called um, Learn to Gardening. It's just all the basics of the garden of, of gardening, new videos that aren't on the channel, and then, uh, but also listing of the videos that I have done on the channel that are relevant to whatever that video is. So anyway, it's kind of an organization of the channel. And there's a, a $50 um, launch uh, discount on that down below the video. It is far from complete. There's only a couple videos on it, maybe three videos on it at this point, but lots more content coming. And I'm gonna to continue to add to that. Once you buy that, you'll own it and whatever gets added to it in the future, you know, is yours as well. So there you go. I'm gonna throw that out there. Uh, and I did a, we did a container plant video this week. Uh, the stuff was in and uh, there's a bulb video I don't know will go up. And a Japanese maple video with Matt at Mr. Maple, I think that's it. I think that's it. So let's get to some questions from last week. Jump right into that. I think I wrote down like 23 or 24 this week. So a lot of good questions uh, this past week. Uh, somebody was asking about planting under old crepe myrtles. So they've got some like 30 foot tall old crepe myrtles. They can be really hard to just plant around. The roots are really, uh, they're good at anchoring themselves into the ground and wanted to know what they could plant around it. Typically in this neighborhood, the only thing I see growing really well under uh, those old established crepe myrtles that people put in the hell strip where they, you know, which is the, the piece between their sidewalk and the road, that little narrow spot where they want to put 40 foot tall trees under power lines, by the way. Um, but the only thing I see ever growing in there well with that, with those is things like liriope and mondo grass and like really, really tough ground cover things. I also think people use mondo grass and liriope and those kinds of things because they can find them in tiny pots and it's really hard to pl find places in between those roots to to plant something so a tiny pot uh, is a good idea but i think you could ultimately get away with any kind of dry shade thing so let's say that's uh, cast iron plants uh, rhodia japonica would work I'm thinking about some of the dry shade things i have that are working well on this back line back here uh, Mahonia, like a small Mahonia would definitely work, like that Beijing Beauty or Soft Caress if you're looking for a short one. Uh, Nandinas would almost certainly work. You can get some of the, uh, one of the newer ones that doesn't produce seed, so it's not invasive. Uh, any sort, any kind of drought, to, you know, super drought tolerant. I think there's probably, there's likely Carex that would grow up underneath it. So you're looking for a dry shade item and you could probably you can probably Google search that for whatever zone you're in, but that's what you're looking for. And hopefully something you can find in a small pot because putting three gallon plants in near established trees can be, can be difficult. Let's see. Uh, somebody asked about, uh, so I contorted that Japanese maple and I wish I'd have brought it out here. I put up a video a few, uh, two or three weeks back now uh, contorting a Japanese maple, similar to how this one back here is contorted, which you won't be able to see uh, the detail of in this video. But uh, 
uh, I, I was showing how I wired the Japanese maple and they wanted to know whether you, not a low graft or a high graft uh, would be would be workable. I would not want a high graft because I, I, I'm only bending the tree above the graft. And so, you know, if the graft is this high off the ground, I, I wouldn't start my curves until after that. So I, a low graft, uh, in my opinion, would be better. I, I don't want to bend the part below the graft. Uh, it's older wood, and I think I don't think it will be quite as pliable or bendable uh, as the uh, wood that's above the graft. Okay. Um, somebody asked if I've ever been stung by a bee or a wasp while gardening. No, never. I, honestly, never while while gardening. I was. Um, I've been stung by a lot of wasp and bees in this lifetime, and probably deserved uh, some of them uh, as a young as a young person. Uh, uh, yellow jackets are actually a bigger problem. Uh, here and I'm assuming for others as well. You know they're so you know because they they're ground dwelling and they're pretty aggressive defending their spaces and so it's pretty easy and over the court over the years of landscaping to have found many uh, yellow jacket nest in the ground and so and they're again they're very aggressive. You know they'll go up your paint you know up your jeans and that kind of thing and just keep biting. Uh, so uh, they're a pain and I got I got interestingly I was filming a. a, a a honey beehive not that long ago and i i did i was doing like maybe 30 seconds of b-roll in front of it and one of them came out and stung me it was like just a warning shot just like hey m keep moving you're welcome to stop and look but keep moving but in their in their day in their normal activities out here of of doing their you know collecting you know collecting what they're out here collecting and and helping you know pollinate all these plants but no they don't even know i exist uh when they're out here in the garden doing their thing uh, somebody asked uh, to show the Empress of China dogwood in the front garden. So here it is. They've got some leaves turning on theirs. Uh, that's no completely normal. Uh, it's evergreen, but a lot of evergreen. Uh, okay, so evergreen conifers, um, which most are. There are some deciduous conifers, but most conifers are evergreen. They thin this time of year. And then some of our leafy evergreens thin this time of year as well. So they'll lose some percentage of the oldest leaves off the plants. And then some of our leafy evergreens shed in the spring as the new growth is coming on them. But every plant does some shedding. That Empress of China dogwood happens to do its, its shedding uh, in the fall right now. So it's just gonna shed some portion of the leaves off of it. And that's what mine's doing as well. It's completely normal. If something is doing it a little more excessively it might be because it was under some sort of stress it may have been dry going into the fall it might be just because it's newly planted it might lose a few more leaves the first year than it would in the future but you know uh, I, it's, it's a non-issue mine, mine is in the process of losing maybe 20 percent of the leaves right now somebody has a moon glow juniper they had planted it and then it sunk um which can happen, you know, when you when you dig a hole, people always go, dig twice the depth of the pot, you know, which, you know, I've never done in my life. Uh, and twice as wide, you know, big, just dig a thousand dollar hole for a ten dollar plant. You know, I've heard, I've always heard those kinds of things. Uh, when you dig a lot of, when you dig way down deep and you put the soil back in the hole, that soil is not as compact as it originally was. And so plant goes in. You water it in, and then the thing thing sinks. <laughs> well, there's a reason it sunk because you've you know the the soil underneath it wasn't compact, and so it, it settled, and it pulled your plant down uh, as it did, or the plant sunk as it did. Uh, and it, this plant hasn't put on any new growth. I see that frequently. If, if things are planted too deep, that's the thing that will happen. They'll just kind of sit there. They go into some sort of weird stasis where they don't do anything. So. Uh, uh, I would just pop it out of the ground, raise it up, put some soil under it. Um, and it'll be it'll be totally fine. But that's all you have to do. But do check check on that around your landscape. It will happen sometimes. Uh, I, but I've never dig deeper. I dig slightly deeper just because you know you're you know you're just digging a hole. Uh, but I don't dig way deep down in the ground. Most of these plants just most of the roots go out this way. Some things have tap roots, but they'll figure that out. Um, they'll figure that out on their own. Okay, let's see. Uh, kale, um, okay, so somebody said their kale and lettuce is small in containers. They're container growing their uh, fall vegetables. Uh, and their beets and carrots are small. The beets and carrots may just be time because they take a little while longer. And, you know, whereas in, I do two rounds of cool season vegetables. I, I 
my cool season vegetables, if you watch the January video, look great over here right now. I'm covering them on nights that are this cold. Uh, but we're getting a short, uh, the season's getting colder so the growth rate actually slows down. I had, I had the soil was quite warm when I put the stuff in two months ago, but the soil temperature is getting cooler. So my, my vegetables are slowing down as opposed to when I plant them again in the end of February or the beginning of March, the soil's warming. And so they'll start slow and pick up pace. Uh, so, you know, you can run out of time with broccoli, beets, carrots, you know, in the fall, you can just flat out run out of time uh, before they had a chance to really get established. I've got good carrots this time. I've got broccoli that's about half the size I'd normally want to pick it. And I think that's where I'm going to have to pick it. I don't think it's going to get any bigger. I think the soil temperature is just too cold now. Uh, so keep that in mind. I think maybe you just ran out of time. And the other thing is the containers being above the ground, they may have been exposed to a little more cold than they would have otherwise. Your lettuce, uh, your leafy greens being uh, smaller than they would. I do, when I do containers with leafy greens, and I've shown this in the past, I do a very shallow container. I think that those lettuces really like to, to get completely rooted out before they put on any top growth. So they like to anchor themselves, get themselves a little bit established. And then, so if you put them in a too deep of a pot or too big of a pot, they stay a little too wet and they don't root in enough to to then put on that big top growth. And so shallow bowls, give them a little root competition and they grow much faster. Uh, and, and you don't have to use as much soil. They're never gonna root down to the bottom of a big container anyway. So shallow bowls for your lettuce, trust me. Um, I've had great success and I, I've taken the bowls in and out, uh, you know, when it got on the coldest nights and been able to grow lettuce pretty much right through the winter here in Raleigh in shallow bowls. Okay. Uh, Somebody, oh, somebody got a Fuji Fall hydrangea mail ordered and it came in fully leafed and wanted to know what to do. I would just be putting it out. Uh, I would just leave it outside in the container. Or you could, in fact, I would probably plant the thing in the ground and I'd just go cover it if I was going to get anything extreme. And by extreme, I mean going right to 25 or lower. But if it's going to be 30, 31, 33, those kinds of things where it would just, that's what it would, be, you know just leave it just just leave it uncovered but get it to sleep without letting it go to an extreme first if that makes any sense but put it in the ground and uh anything below 25 throw a cover on it oh uh, let's see uh, so oh, this is a great this is a great question um i wish um uh, i don't know if i've ever even really um explained this one um this person also said they had a stupid question. There are literally no stupid questions ever. I mean, that's just, um, uh, all, all, you know, every, everybody has to start somewhere, learn, you know, from, you know, there's a beginning, there's a, you know, there's a beginning for everybody, you know, at w whatever level you're at, if you have no experience or whatever, this is actually not a stupid question at all. In, in, in fact, um, uh, again, no, none of them are stupid, but this one's especially not stupid. It's a great question. They wanted to know, uh, the difference between a shrub and a perennial, which is really, really kind of funny. So basically in, in the world of like botany, a perennial is any plant that lives more than a year, you know, or, you know, comes or comes back every year or is, uh, you know, so that would include things that die to the ground, like a hosta that would include, um, you know, uh, kind of non woody perennials that stay evergreen like a cast iron plant that would include a shrub that would include a tree it would literally include anything that lives more than a year and so that's the actual definition but in horticulture we've kind of separated that word off to mean a group of plants that uh, does something almost changeable in the winter time and so it might be that it's a hosta that goes completely dormant, never becomes woody, and goes completely dormant back to the ground in the winter time. It might include our woody perennials that, you know, like a coneflower or rudbeckia or something like that, that becomes woody, but it still dies back to the ground uh, in the winter time. It might include like the fleshy kind of plants that don't become woody, but stay evergreen. Maybe that's a fern, or like I just said, cast iron plants. Rodeo would be another example of that. Um, of course, fern, there are ferns that go completely, most, a lot of our ferns go completely dormant as well and don't ever become woody. 
or plants like lantana or butterfly bushes that actually are shrubs technically but we cut them all the way back to the ground in the late winter almost because they bloom on new growth and so those ended up in a you know for some people in a perennial category and so it's just basically in two different worlds uh, we're using the words uh, differently we kind of use in horticulture we're using the word perennial for plants that just don't fit into the group of woody shrubs you know that you know we just stay in our landscape and really aren't, aren't all that changeable you know they just do their pattern every year and trees uh, and then all the other things go in this group we call perennial but technically they're all perennials if they're coming back uh, year to year but it's a great question uh, and it's it's one of those things that you say it's a perennial plant nursery well so is the guy growing shrubs he's a perennial plant nursery too <laughs> but we have reserved the word uh, for a group of plants that we just don't have a better description of than that thing changes a whole lot in the winter time <laughs> or at the end of winter we cut it to the ground you know that would include grasses uh, you know my carex back here is actually you know, this is an evergreen grass-like plant. Carex is not a grass technically, but uh, it looks like grass. Uh, and we cut them to the ground in, the, uh, in, in March every year uh, to, and the new growth comes back on them. And so it's in the perennials. <laughs> and, you know, so that's, that's all it is. It's, it's kind of, but it's, it's a great question, honestly. But it's just in two different worlds using the word differently, which is, you know, how language works. Language is just here to... Uh, create questions like that uh, okay so anybody ask if i was planning a trip to the uk at some point to cover gardens yeah absolutely um, it won't happen this next year this next year is pretty planned out but uh, the year after that i plan on going to uh, europe and my son's in europe I, you guys saw i did a question and answer with charlie on the channel last year um, him and i went on a big epic trip and we try to do that once a year our um my epic trip with him next year is in Germany. He's working in Germany for a year. Uh, so um, uh, I'm going over to visit him. He's coming home for Christmas, but I'm going over there uh, with him. But I don't know if I'll shoot anything while I'm going to visit my son in Germany, who I have, will not have seen at that point in three or four months. So we'll see. Uh, somebody asked about the, what the, several people actually asked what the thumbnail was in last week's question and answer video. It's a Solosia that's on the front foundation, but it was after it had some frost on it. So they, it was hanging down. Uh, and I just thought it was an interesting uh, photo. Uh, that's an annual Celosia, but Celosia will, uh, will seat itself. So it'll be back. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked, oh, so, so somebody asked about planting conifers in containers and basically would that stunt them? Meaning, you know, that maybe the conifer says it gets 15 feet tall, could you keep it smaller than that in a container? Yeah, root restriction will definitely uh, decrease the size that a plant's really capable of, of getting. So yes, that's very helpful. I've got a Boulevard Cypress in a container behind the camera back here, and Boulevard Cypress can get, honestly, as big as you want to let them get, you know, uh, but that thing can stay in that container three or four years. Um, and I feel, I feel like I've won. If I can get three or four years out of something, in a container. I may have to step it up into a slightly larger container at some point, but then if I don't have room in the landscape, it can just be given away um, or go on the compost pile if it doesn't look great at that point. Let's see. Uh, somebody asked about grafting different species. So, you know, back here, you know, the Japanese maples grafted. Actually, the Tokyo Tower, Kyananthus, that yellow leafed uh, tree right there, that's another graft. Uh, that's a uh, an upright, narrow Chinese uh, fringe tree, and it's grafted onto a regular um, Chinese fringe tree. So uh, I talked about the purposes of graft and the reason you graft, and then somebody asked if different species can be grafted. Yes, different species within the same genus uh, typically can be grafted together, and that's usually how it works. So. Uh, uh, you know, you can you, you can you can graft a you know one a, one species of of you know of of maple onto another onto another that kind of thing because the but the gen, the genus Acer being maple uh, and then the different species and that's typically how it works. It works best if you're grafting onto the same species and so that Tokyo Tower Kyananthus is actually rooted onto the same species, okay. Uh, but it would probably work on another species within the same genus. You, you, you can't really graft above genus, though. And you think about 
um, uh, like prunus, the genus prunus, which includes all of our stone fruit. So like peaches and plums, that kind of thing. Those are always grafted. There's four, um, gosh, there's probably 400 species of prunus. Uh, uh, you know, within the genus prunus, there's probably 400 species. Almost all of those are intergrafted with one another. So, you know, uh, peaches can be grafted onto plums and, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, it works at the species level, uh, not at the, you know, above, you know, above genus or in a family like within you know within a bigger within a bigger group of the family it doesn't it doesn't work probably some rare cases where it works but it's not probably going to be a very vigorous plant okay hopefully 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 that makes sense but you know you have species and then genus and then the family and then the king, kingdom you know it's like a it, it, everything everything rank but once you get above a certain level they're no longer relate very related at all um you know I mean, our, 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 our side of the world has, uh, you know, uh, mushrooms on it, <laughs> you know, and on, it's on, it's on the, it's, it's, we're closer related to a, to a mushroom than a mushroom is to a plant. So, you know, we're not, we're not going to be, uh, we're, we're, we're not, <laughs> we're, we're, a, we're a lot different. Uh, you know, we're a lot different once you get that far up the ladder. Okay. Um, do I leave tags on plants? No, typically I don't leave them on if they're hanging, although there's probably some example of it uh, out here. But I do like to leave tags uh, in the ground on some things because sometimes we get behind on actually mapping them on, you know, on paper. And so for some period of time, we will leave a tag stuck in the ground. All of our containers, the tags are slid into one side of the container. Uh, so there's no container out here I couldn't walk up to, look around the inside rim of the container and not find the tag for what's in it, um, which is super, super helpful. Let's see. Um, somebody asked if Juliet Clara would be a good foundation plant. Keep in mind, it gets eight feet tall. So yeah, it's a great foundation plant, probably best on a corner or if you had really high windows or you had some space where you're just trying to cover up, you know, a long wall that doesn't have any windows. A uh, perfect plant for that. They asked if the roots would be a problem. No, um, Clara make great foundation plants, but most people probably regret having Clara on their foundation because they have to prune them and prune them and prune them and prune them. Juliet will grow slower because it's variegated, uh, but I wouldn't place it where you've got to keep it four feet tall forever. I would put place it where you can allow it to get eight feet tall and then you won't have to do a lot of work on it. Somebody asked, they have Nandinas that they're gonna be moving and should they uh, root prune them now? Nandinas, even old established ones, come out and move super, super easy. You can root prune it if you want to, but I've removed 15, 20 year old Nandinas and they just pop right out of the ground. Uh, I don't think you'll have any problem moving it whether you root prune it or not whenever you decide to move it. Uh, let's see, uh, ground, somebody lives in an area where the ground's already frozen and they want to buy some discount bulbs wanted to know uh, what to do with them. Well, so somebody answered this question and said you could just put them in containers, and that's absolutely true. You could put them in containers, uh, and then uh, keep them from, you know, uh, you could put them in the garage, something like that, and keep them uh, cool <laughs> so that they stay dormant, uh, but not frozen solid. So, so somewhat, somewhere in between, if you have a garage, that's probably a good spot for that, an unheated, an unheated garage. Uh, you could do that. Uh, you could buy them, put them in containers, and then uh, and then if you have some warm days during the winter, you know, and, and, the, and the ground thaws enough, you could stick them in the ground anytime uh, during the winter. But you can't, what you can't, what you shouldn't do is buy them and then hold them uh, without putting them in the ground. Uh, because keep in mind, a bulb out of the ground is in the process of dying. Okay, so it's, uh, uh, let's see. Somebody asked another question about this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and answer that right now. Um, they're in the process of dying. You know, there's water, there's moisture in that bulb, and these are dry. This is a lot of dry air uh, this time of year. And so your bulbs are in the process of, of shrinking and shriveling and dying while they're out of the ground. And then somebody asked later another question I had about some sort of gluey material that was on their bulbs. That was in all likelihood wax. They do... You will sometimes see bulbs, especially amaryllis bulbs, um, where they'll put wax on the outside of them. It basically, that prevents some of that uh, respiration, I guess, um, 
you know, that water leaving the bulb and it drying out and dying over time. So um, I'll answer both of those questions at the same time. Wax will prevent them from dying, you know, as quickly, but they'll still, again, they're, they're this bulb, every bulb you see on a shelf somewhere, it's in the process of dying. Uh, it needs to go in the ground or go in a container and get some moisture back around it again sooner than later. Uh, so somebody asked me what piqued my interest in gardening, and I think, you know, I, I had a job at a garden center as a teenager. I've said this many times, but I think overall the thing that's been most interesting to me in my time in this business has, has been... Um, I got another porch being built up here. I'm, I'm guessing you can hear in this one too. It's just like one project ends and another one starts uh, for a while now. It's good, really been a, kind of a wild ride. Um, good, it's good though. I guess everybody will have all new stuff and then it'll be it'll be quiet. Um, let's see. Uh, what the main thing that's kept me interested in this business the whole time has always been propagation. So starting plants and so how to root them. Um, how to make more of them. Uh, that's always uh, probably been, even when I worked in the garden center when I was 16 years old, um, it was fast, it's always been fascinating to me how new plants are made. Um, and so, you know, that's all, you know, I think everybody's gonna be fond of something. And I think right now it's probably more or less just uh, sustainability in gardening for me now. It's probably the driving factor for me now is just figuring out uh, you know, how going forward, the, you know, individual landowners, homeowners, and little small plots, how do we impact the overall uh, world around us and uh, how to be as sustainable as possible going forward, producing some of our own food or calories and, 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 and being able to enjoy the space and, you know, not spend a fortune and not have a negative impact on the world around us. You know, that, that's kind of my driving thing now. Had the sun right in my face uh, over there. Somebody asked about growing bulbs and containers in zone five. And you absolutely can. I don't think you want the containers just frozen solid for week after week after week. Uh, the, uh, I think it'd probably be best again in an unheated garage and then, you know, outside when it's, they need cold. You know, they need that cold treatment in order to come up and bloom well and do well. But if you're in an area of zone five where it just can stay frozen for three or four weeks in a container, uh, that that seem that seems excessive. So um, you know may, maybe an unheated garage would be the best idea. Once they start breaking dormancy, you know you bring them out into the sun. Uh, let's see. Uh, so somebody um, said every time they went to Lowe's, they saw a plectranthus um, uh, argentatus, which is that silver plectranthus. Uh, and uh, wanted to know. Oh, they said they they said they um, they saw that it was invasive or something somewhere. Well, it's a, it's a zone ten or eleven perennial, so it's not going to be invasive for anybody who's not in a space where it's not perennial. So that's true with a lot of plectranthus. You know, plectranthus is in the uh, you know is a is salvia like. Uh, it's in the mint. It's in the mint family. Uh, great for poll almost all plectranthus are great for uh, pollinators and I've shown a couple plectranthus in the garden you don't see some of the plectranthus varieties we won't see in the stores all that much because they're they're kind of breakable you know they don't ship they don't ship real they don't ship real well but this one's a little silver mounding one uh, that ships you know would, would ship just fine and it's a sturdy plant but it's an annual for almost everyone watching this video that's outside of 10 zone 10 and 11 but uh, down in tropical areas probably um, probably is invasive probably probably a lot of things that grow in the tropics if you put them in some other tropical space they're gonna hit the ground you know and not it's no different there than it was the other place uh, so that they'll probably be aggressive but yeah not one I worry about if you're not in zone 10 or 11 we have a lot of plants you know where some lantana is very invasive down in Florida uh, up here in North Carolina our control is winter so we don't have an issue with it. Butterfly bush is wildly invasive in the Pacific Northwest and over in the UK. Uh, here in the Southeast, you know, I've seen a couple seedlings here or there, uh, but almost none. So it's interesting, you know, the, cold, the colder winter is the control or something is the control for it, you know, in, that, in, 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 in one area and in another area, it's just, you know, a, an invasive plant, it's kind of wild. 
Let's see, somebody asked about identifying a Japanese maple that they had gotten somewhere off a throwaway pile somewhere, wanted to identify it. It would be, I mean, there are, there are probably 2,000 plus named cultivar, you know, named varieties of Japanese maples. I think it would be almost impossible to name one. I will say that if it's an upright red one, blood good is, you know, 50% of them that are sold at any kind of box store, or, you know, um, you know, there are some, you know, five to 10 varieties that are very, very, very common. It, it might, it's probably one of them if it was on a throwaway pile or a clearance rack somewhere. So uh, that it might be possible to identify it, but just overall, if you ask me the variety of a Japanese maple, I, I, I mean, I might throw out that it's blood good, but there's, I don't, who knows how many red upright cultivars of, uh, of, 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 just, of, red, you know, of Japanese maples there are. I mean, just, just in one identifier, you know, there's probably 300 different ones and there's subtle fall, difference, fall differences, subtle differences in the leaf shape maybe it's a slight difference in the color it leaves out in the spring and someone named it and you know they know the difference i guess uh let's see somebody asked about watering laura petalum has to come up every week the purple plant that's behind me here uh watering laura petalum and copper top viburnum in georgia in the winter time uh you know what if you're getting any kind of regular rainfall i don't think you would need to water them in the winter time i've been getting a lot of questions about watering in the winter but definitely if it's dry, you know, you would want to water them. I can't imagine in, you know, that in Georgia, the soil moisture hasn't increased at this point. I don't think you'd have to do any watering on them. And I always, wa I always water, worry. I worry more about people overwatering than underwatering always. I have seen, there's virtually, it's pretty rare when I see a plant that somebody's killed without watering it. I mean, they'll do that on your you know, house plants. It's easy to do, and it's easy, to, it's easy to do outside certain times of the year. But for the most part, I think the vast majority of plants are loved to death. They were planted in, you know, again, that, you know, digging this $100 hole for a $10 plant thing. They put too much organic material in. They over-fertilize them, over-water them. They just... they. They invested in something, and now they're almost paranoid about it and just kind of overdo. Okay, let's see. I did the wax question about the bulbs. A um, couple more here, and then we'll be done with this for this week. Again, you can ask gardening questions down below uh, for next week's. Um, somebody asked about putting containers in the ground for the winter to winter protect them. You can do this, but keep in mind there's a, that, there's a hole in the bottom of the container where the water needs to get out of the container. And so if you, if you dig a hole and set the container down in the ground, put soil around it, there's nowhere for that water to get. It's, that water's not gonna get out of the bottom of that hole easy enough. And your, your pot's gonna end up flooding if you get any rain during the uh, winter time. So um, you can dig a hole and do this, but I'd have some gravel at the bottom of the hole where you're setting the pot on or uh, bricks, anything that will elevate the container a little bit. I think overall it's unnecessary for most people. Use the leaves that are falling and just put your pots close together, pile the leaves up around them, just kind of bury the whole thing in leaves. Be prepared to throw a sheet over it if it gets to some extreme. Uh, but for the most part, most things can be protected that way. Just putting them pot to pot and then piling all the leaves you got up around them. Um, that's how nature protects things in the winter time. And then last question, somebody had roofing done and the roofers trampled their black lace elderberry and wanted to know if it would recover. I don't see, I don't, you know, obviously I'm not seeing the damage, so I don't know how bad it's damaged. But most of the time, those deciduous, um, you know, plants that lose their leaves in the winter, those deciduous flowering shrubs are about the hardiest things, the things that we can cut back to the ground almost. I, you know, I put butterfly bush in that group that one of those plants that can break off to the ground and come right back for uh, you know, clara, any kind of established uh, deciduous flowering shrubs, Why, wygela, I mean, there's, I could go on and on and on. Just, just those, those, those ones that go to sleep in the winter, they're usually pretty good at being able to put up new material uh, from their own roots. And so I would imagine that the, uh, the elderberry will come back from whatever damage they did to it, if it had any, if it had been in the ground for any period of time. Obviously, 
you know, if you plant something and then immediately break it off, it might not be capable of coming back because it just doesn't have that stored root energy and it was already under stress from being planted. But if it's a well-established one, I think almost any deciduous flowering shrub that falls into that category, you know, of, you know, those are the things normally you can cut to the ground and they'll just come up with new, new stems on them. So there you go. Thank you guys for following along with the channel and uh, watching the videos. And uh, again, you can ask gardening questions down below. Thanks for watching.